In this video, we're going to talk about some basic painting techniques. We're going to cover how to dilute your paint, how to prime your models a couple of different ways, including doing a zenithal prime. And then we'll cover things like dry brushing, base coating, and layering to really lay down the fundamentals on techniques that you're going to use throughout your hobby career. So before we can paint a miniature, we first have to prime it. And the first way we can do this is with an airbrush. And we will be using Vallejo's Airbrush Flow Improver, as well as their Black Surface Primer. So the first step is to load a few drops of Flow Improver into our airbrush, followed by enough Surface Primer to cover the model. A little goes a long way. If you need more, add more. You don't want to have too much and be left with a lot in your brush. We do a couple of test sprays to ensure that the flow improver has adequately mixed with the primer, and then we start spraying on the model. I find that the black primer covers very, very well and only takes one or two coats to ensure an even coverage. I spray from a distance of about two or three inches, and I make sure that the primer has dried on a part before I go back for a second coat. Now the advantage to priming with an airbrush is that I am able to spray into all the nooks and crannies without wasting paint and with minimal effort. And once I have finished priming the model with the surface primer, I set the model aside to dry for at least a couple of hours for it to fully harden and cure before I can paint the model. A second method of priming models is to use a rattle or aerosol can. And to begin with, we have to shake the can for two to three minutes vigorously at room temperature. Now this is important to ensure that we get a nice even spray of paint from the primer and to avoid frosting when spraying things like a rattle can varnish. And once we've shaken the can and it's properly agitated, we are ready to move outside to prime our model. When we prime our model, we want to hold the can at a distance of about 12 inches from the model and we want to do nice gentle passes to ensure even coverage and to allow the paint to dry before spraying our next coat. We continue doing these passes until the model is appropriately covered and primed and we can set the model aside to dry. To do a zenithal prime, we begin first with a dark primer base coat. I started with black in this instance but you can start with a dark gray if you wanted. It all depends on how deep you want your shadows to be. Once we have our model, we have to figure out where we want our light source to be. Now, I typically place my light sources at about three quarters top down from the forward angle, so the light is shining directly on the figure's face. So on top of our black primer, we are going to put a drop of flow improver and then begin with a first pass of Vallejo's surface gray primer. We do a couple of prick sprays to ensure that the flow improver and primer are properly mixed. And then we start spraying on our model, taking care to only spray from the direction of the light source and to preserve some of our deepest shadows on the opposite end. We move nice and slowly here, and you can see that we're concentrating our highlights on the top of the head, the face, the top of the chest, and the arms. Most of the other parts of the model will receive a very light dusting to help simulate some of the ambient light reflecting from the environment around. Once we've done a gray pass, we are now ready to hit the model up with a white surface primer. Once we've emptied our airbrush, we again drop a few drops of flow improver and then our white surface primer from Vallejo. We only need a small amount because we are going to be concentrating this highlight only on the head, the face, and the top of the chest and shoulders. And really the goal is just to bring some extra focus to these parts and to provide a base for our extreme zenithal highlight. 
And that's it. We have Zenith Parameter Model, and it's ready for paint. Before we get into the basic painting techniques, it's important to understand the ingredients of paint and to understand how acrylic paint actually works. So acrylic paint is actually made of two prime ingredients. You have the binder, which gives the paint its handling and durability characteristics and helps the pigment powders adhere to the surface. And then you actually have the pigment powder itself, which is a dry powder material, and it gives the paint its color. And it's important to understand the interactions between these two ingredients because it impacts how we approach dilution of paint. Uh, it impacts how we think of glazes, and it helps to build the understanding of a technique called feathering, which I will get into in a moment. So basically, as the binder in the acrylic paint evaporates, it leaves the pigment on the surface, and that's what gives the paint its color, or our perception of that paint's color. And what happens is when we mix paints, we're combining different pigments to create different colors. And you can think of it like the old ink dot newspaper comics that you used to see. The more dots that are closer together, the greater the change or the, the greater the impact it has on our perception of its color. And you can think of pigments and paint the same way. They're essentially putting dots of color. And when we put layers of paint on top of other layers of paint, we're essentially laying down additional dots of pigment how much of that pigment we lay down and in how small or great of an area changes the way we view that color. And we use that knowledge to create smooth blends and color nuances. And it's important to understand this when it comes to diluting our paint, because when we add water or, or some other dilution medium to our paint, we are changing this binder to pigment ratio. What ends up happening is the more diluted paint becomes, the less pigment it has, comparative to binder, which means that the pigment ends up being weaker in color, the more it's diluted, to a point where we dilute it too much. When we dilute a paint with something that's not a binder, to a point where there is insufficient binder to help the pigment adhere to a surface, this creates issues like poor durability, and it creates these tide marks and chalkiness because the pigment isn't being distributed evenly. But you'll end up with clumps of this pigment powder stuck in little batches or sections to create these spotty and uneven layers of paint. So you can see as I am adding more water to this blue, it's getting much weaker in its strength compared to the original color, our diluted mix. For every equivalent drop of paint or paint and water. The more water and binder there is, there's the less pigment there is to cover an area. This also happens when we spread the paint out. We're spreading out an equal amount of pigment over the same area. And so the more we spread out, the weaker it becomes. And we use this to our advantage when we are laying down glazes and when we feather out our colors. We're using this knowledge of paint dilution and of the way pigments behave and the way we perceive these pigments of color to create these soft transitions and to either nuance the color or to help smooth out some of our rougher blends. Now, when it comes to pigment strength, uh, some pigments are just naturally stronger than others. Colors like your blues, your reds, your greens and purples, their pigments are just naturally stronger than colors like whites, yellows, and brighter flesh tones. And what this means is that Paints with stronger pigments will cover more easily than those with weaker pigments. And paints with weaker pigments will also require more coats to apply evenly and sometimes require building up from other colors. For example, like using a gray to build up to a white. What this also means is that we need to dilute colors with stronger pigments much more to reduce their strength, while weaker pigments don't require as much dilution. So this green, for example, That's about one-to-one -one water to paint. And you can see that the color is still fairly equivalent to the pure paint. We have to keep adding more and more parts of water to really reduce that strength. A color like this yellow And even just one-to-one, -one, 
you can already see how much weaker it is compared to its pure paint. And this is also important when we try and mix colors. It takes a lot more of a weaker pigment to impact the paint with stronger pigment. So for example, mixing this yellow and this green at a one-to-one, -one, we can see that it's still mostly green. There is a touch of yellow, it's a little more on the lime green side because of the yellow, but it's still very strongly green. And we have to mix much, much more of the yellow to really impact the perception of this color to push it more towards yellow as opposed to green. So this is about four parts yellow to one part green. There's still a little bit on the green, it's in between, but you can see that it's more noticeably yellow now. And I find it's helpful when you're mixing paints or colors with weak and strong pigments to start with your weaker color and mixing in just a small amount of your stronger color to achieve your mix, fine tuning with the colors as you go. This way you can fine tune your color more easily without wasting a lot of paint. So most acrylic paints made by miniature companies are actually a combination of different pigments, especially flesh tones, and they're very rarely a pure pigment. And so sometimes differences in manufacturing batches or a change in recipes over time can lead to inconsistencies. So there isn't always a hard and fast rule of what colors are strong, what colors are weak, especially with colors like a flesh tone, which are always a mix of like yellows, reds, whites, and browns. So a good rule of thumb that I usually follow is that the brighter a color is out of the bottle, the weaker I anticipate the pigment will be. But really experimentation experience will definitely help you here. So feathering as a technique is essentially pulling out paint from the brush. And what you're doing is as you're pulling the paint out and as your stroke continues, you're spreading less and less pigment over a larger surface area. And we can use this to create gradients of color. We can use this to create soft nuances and really lay down smooth, gentle transitions very easily. And you can do this with diluted paint or not. It's really in the technique. This is pure blue. And as we pull the paint out, you can see that there's less and less pigment that's being transferred from the brush to the palette. There was a lot in this initial part and we pulled out more and more and more until this is just the residual water and moisture from the brush, the palette, and just a little bit of pigment. And really what we do is when we're feathering, that's all we're doing. We're laying down a bit of a base color or we're laying down a bit of an initial color and we're just gonna pull the paint out to reduce the amount of pigment we're laying down over time to create a transition like this. Feathering takes a bit of time to get a very smooth transition, especially on a model. But the more you do it, the more familiar you become with the technique and over time you'll master it and it'll be second nature to you. So dry brushing as a technique is a very easy way to lay down color and pick out raised details and textures on the surface without much effort. You can use any sort of brush to dry brush, but it works a lot more easily if you use an older brush or something with shorter, stiffer bristles, like this Artist Opus brush here, or you can even use just some cheap makeup brushes that have these soft, stiff bristles on the end. Really, the, the, the shorter the bristles are, the easier I think this technique is. And really what we want to do when we dry brush is to just get a little bit of color on our brush. And we're looking to wipe away most of the color. You can use a piece of paper towel or something like this texture pad to help remove most of the paint so that there's only a very little bit of this residue left on the bristles. The paint will be almost dry and that's what lends its name the dry brush. So once we have our brush prepared with the color, we're just going to gently move it back and forth on the surface of the model. You don't have to press too hard to catch these raised details. Just a soft touch and gently moving your brush back and forth will actually help you pick up more of these details easily.
if you push too hard, you're going to find you're going to be jamming the brush too much into the crevices and you're going to lose some of that texture and that detail. So you're just aiming to lightly brush it across the surface. to catch those raised edges. When you're doing your dry brush, there are a couple of ways you can actually lay down the color. You can go in an up-down motion, left or right. You can do circle. You can just do a random whatever. There's no right or wrong way, but it's important to note that the direction of the brush impacts the way that the paint is applied. So when I'm dry brushing this base coat, for example, I'm not too worried about my, my lights and shadows. I'm just looking to get the color, this dark, this dark brown color, all over the bone as a base coat. And so I'm happy to move in a circular motion. I find that it helps me apply the color very easily. And the circular motion also helps to hide some of the brush strokes that are gonna result from our dry brushing. When dry brushing highlights especially, it's important to consider the motion of your brush as it determines where paint is being applied on the surface of your model. If we apply our highlights in a circular motion, all the color ends up being spread around fairly evenly from all directions, and it's very hard to maintain a consistent point of highlight like we would if we were hand painting. So what we really wanna do when we're dry brushing our highlights is to ensure that we are dry brushing in the direction of our light. So if our light source is coming from this direction and flowing down, we want the brush stroke to move in a relatively similar direction. And what this will do is as we're bringing the brush strokes down, it's catching these top surfaces and it's completely missing some of these bottom ones, allowing us to build these highlights and maintain some of these shadows without the finesse of hand painting them all. The next technique we're going to learn is the base coat. All the base coat really is, is laying down a nice even coat of paint to form the base layer upon which you layer colors on top. Whether your base coat is the darkest color or a medium tone or a bright tone doesn't matter. All that matters is it's the base color that you're laying all your layers on top of. I'd like to base coat my deepest color and layer my highlights up. And so I will almost always base coat with my darkest tone. Now to lay down a nice base coat, all we have to do is dilute our paint and apply a couple of thin coats depending on the color. So the next technique we're going to learn is called layering. Now really all layering is, is an extension of base coating. But instead of just laying down a base color, we're layering down progressive coats of paint to either build up a highlight or to deepen a shadow. And to do this, all we do is we take our paint, we dilute it to an appropriate ratio, and we lay down our color in progressive coats, leaving a little more of the previous layer showing as we go up to create this transition of color. How smooth this transition becomes all depends on the number of steps that you do for your layering process, how subtle the transitions are between your highlights, and whether you're doing things like glazing or feathering extra coats of color on top to help smooth up the shadows, or whether you're wet blending it. The idea of layering is to build up or build down a color. So at its most simple, let's say I wanted to layer on some highlights onto this blue armor, and I wanna use my deep sea blue, my black forest green, this orati green, and the spring green. They are, you can see, progressively brighter in color. And we can layer these colors one on top of the other to create transitions of color. So directly on top of my deep sea blue, for example, I could take black forest green, and put a simple layer on. Now you may find, depending on the color, you may have to do several coats to get a nice even layer. But the goal is 
to leave a bit of your previous coat of paint showing. So you see I've left some of my deep sea blue right here. So let's say I wanted to do a second layer of this black forest green to continue building this highlight. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go over the first coat, but this time I'm not gonna go in as far. So you can see there is my deep blue layer. There is a thin layer of my first black forest green coat here, and then a layer of my second black forest green coat here. Now the jump from black forest green to this erati green is very sudden. So for my next highlight, I'm going to do a 50-50 mix of the two colors to get a mid-tone green that sits between the two. And I'm just going to do my next layer. Now, once again, I've left my deep sea blue, my first black forest green, and my second black forest green showing, and I'm working my way down towards this bottom corner. For my next layer, I'm going to add a little more of this Arati green into my mix, and I'm just going to focus more color. I'm also going to extend this highlight along the edge of the armor. And then for my next highlight, I am going to add pure Arati green, focusing just on the edge of this armor. And that's all layering really is. It's just building up successive coats of color. How sudden or how smooth the transition is all depends on how you're applying your coats, how thin the coats are, the transitions between the colors. The more subtle you make them, the more subtle of a blend you can have. You can also take it the reverse and go super sharp and have sudden jumps if that's your preferred style. Going from one color to the immediate next, doing lines of layers to build up your highlight like I've done over here. Here we can see another version or another variation of the layering method where I've been much more liberal with my highlights. I've kept some of my deep blue shadows here in some of the darkest corners from this direction, but I've really gone much brighter over the majority of the armor on the front side. So I've taken it much brighter to the erati green and almost spring green color in some spots. And both are just done with the same technique. We're just taking thin coats of paint and we're working up multiple passes of the same color to build up that intensity, leaving little bits of our darker colors showing where we want our shadows to be and placing the brighter colors where we want our highlights to be working their way up. Now the next technique we're gonna learn is the edge highlight. And the edge highlight very simply is a highlight along the edge of a surface, whether it's a plate of armor or edge of a bone. And to do this, we're simply going to use our highlight color. In this case, we're using spring green, which is a very bright green color. And we're going to drag the tip of our brush just along the edge of the armor. Now edge highlighting is very useful for defining edges and corners where objects and planes meet. Just be careful when you're edge highlighting where your light source is coming from. Now the next technique we're gonna learn is called the wash. And very simply, the wash is about laying down a diluted layer of color that's designed to tint an entire surface and shade the deepest recesses. You can use any color to do a wash. All that matters is how you dilute it. Although you find that if you just dilute with water, too much of a dilution will end up not pulling in the shadows like you want. You may have to use something like an actual paint thinning medium or something like future floor wax to help 
break the surface tension to get the wash to work the way you want it to. Washes are most effective when you use paints that are specifically designed to be done as washes. So a good example is Games Workshop's Contrast Paint Range. They are designed to break surface tension and not pool all over the model. Instead, it's gonna give a nice even tint to the top surfaces and it's going to collect some of the color into the deepest shadows. Now, because this color is designed to work out of the pot, we won't be diluting it at all. And we're just going to wash her shirt. Now, some care still has to be taken when applying a wash to a model. You want to make sure that there's not too much paint pooling up on any one surface. Otherwise, you're going to get blobs of pigment and color that aren't shading quite as properly. Now, you can also see on this model that I have done a zenithal base coat. Now, this is very effective with the washing technique because we've already naturally defined some of these highlights and shadows with our whites and black. And so by applying our controlled wash on top, we accentuate these lights and shadows from our priming stage. And we are able to get a very convincing shade without a whole lot of effort while tinting the entire surface, the color that we want in this case red. So you can see already we have some very lovely highlights on the top of her chest and as well as on the tops of these folds, but we have these nice shadows in these crevices here. So the next technique we're gonna learn is called glazing. And what this really is, is a thin controlled wash. You wanna think back to our understanding of pigments and how our perception of a color can change when you start mixing pigments together. So when you take a color and you dilute it heavily, where it's mostly water with a touch of pigment, you can see that it's very, very much lighter than the original color. So what this tells us is there's not as much pigment on that surface or in this, in this paint mix. So the way we can use this diluted wash, unlike a wash where we apply it liberally over the entire surface and just let it cover the entire thing, we wanna control how this color is applied and sits on our model. And we can use it to lay down some blue pigments along an entire surface to mix in and tone down some of these colors. Remember, perceptually, because we're mixing in some of this blue pigment with this green pigment, our eyes are going to perceive these dots of color or the, these dried pigment powders together and give the illusion that they're darker than they actually are, even though the pigments themselves haven't changed. And so by using these thin layers of paint in a controlled manner, you can see how I am just feathering the color out and building up my layers of color. I'm starting to smooth out some of that roughness by laying in some of this deep blue, deep blue color. And you can really do this with any color. If we wanted to, for example, nuance some red into the shadow, we might take our red paint, thin down, and lay down a wash. That's controlled, remember. We're glazing with control and we're feathering up the color. And you can see as it dries how the red subtly tints the blue color, where in some angles it almost looks purplish, where it's just pure blue and red. But if we're gonna start bringing it into the green, 
we see how it interacts with the green as well and subtly shifts the color. Now all we're doing is we're laying down a very thin coat of color, mostly water with just a touch of pigment, and the pigment that's being spread around, what limited value or what limited amount there is, is just enough to start changing the way our eye perceives this color. Our layering in combination with this glazing is a very easy and effective method to get smooth blends without a lot of effort. And with practice, you can get some very, very lovely color nuances and blends with just these two. And you don't have to glaze the deepest shadow. Let's say, for example, in this armor plate section, I only want to take it as far back as my black forest with a bit of Arati. The same method, we just get a glaze of our color, heavily diluted, and we're just going to glaze it in. We're just going to lay it in and feather that color out to create a nice, soft, smooth transition. So the last technique we're going to learn in this video is the wet blend. The wet blend is particularly challenging because it requires really good brush control, a solid understanding of the strengths of your color pigments and how they mix together, and being able to work quickly and confidently to create a smooth blend from A to B or A, B, C, depending on how many colors you want to wet blend together. The easiest wet blends will be from two, between two colors, straight A to B, but if you're particularly experienced with the technique, you can actually wet blend through multiple stages of color as long as you keep working while the color is wet. In this example, we're going to wet blend from this deep sea blue up into our Arati green. Rather than layering it, we're gonna try and lay down a blend in one smooth go. Demonstrating on this gauntlet, I'm going to put my deep sea blue right here, and I'm gonna put my Arati green over here, which means that my black forest green We'll want to go somewhere along there. So to start, we're going to take our deep sea blue and we're going to dilute it just a bit, but not too much so as to make the base coat too watery. And really what we want to do is we want to cover about a third to a half of the gauntlet in this color. While it is still wet and before it dries, we're going to take our black forest green And, mix it in. and you can see that I've pushed the color a little too far and I've lost some of that blue. But that's okay, while the paint is still wet, we just take a bit of our blue and we bring it back. Now, while those colors are still wet, we want to now take our Arati green, place it on the opposite end and just keep working that transition. And you can see very quickly that we are able to block in a relatively smooth blend up until we hit the Arati green. Now, because I am familiar with this color, I know that Arati green, despite being green color, has a distinctly weak pigment tone in the sense that it requires quite a few coats to get a strong base coat. So I know that if I keep trying to wet blend my Arati green, it's just gonna leave streaks and be very, very messy and it's gonna ruin the blend. However, one of the advantages of wet blending is that we can very quickly lay down an initial blend over which we can now work with our layering steps and our glazing to bring in some extra color. So on top of this, I can take a Roddy Green, dilute it a touch, and layer that color back in. and we're just feathering that color back. Mixing in just a touch of black forest green or deep sea blue as we get into our mid-tone and our shadows, just to help that color along. And you can see even that is a bit of a wet blend because the colors are still wet and we're mixing them together to create that blend. 
very often you're going to find that you're never going to be using any of these techniques in exclusion. You're always going to be combining them, working back and forth, and taking the strengths of each of these techniques to combine together into your own personal style. Really mastering these processes and these techniques is all about practice and experience. The more you do them, the more you use them, you're going to find that you're going to get better and better at them until they become second nature. So if you enjoyed the video, give it a like. Don't forget to subscribe for more awesome content every week and follow my Instagram at SirJohnTheHo for daily updates on my hobby projects. Until next time, happy hobbying.